How's it going everybody and welcome back to Lead Therapy and thank you so very much for taking time for tuning into my video. October 14th marked one year since I had a visit from the ATF and I planned on making that video on October 14th but something came up I had to help a family member who needed some help and then yesterday on the 15th I started to make the video and then I got one of my migraine headaches. So hopefully the third time is the charm. Before I get on with the video if you enjoyed the video or if I give you some information you didn't know please like, share, and subscribe and hit those post notifications. It helps the channel out tremendously. Let me first start out by saying I've never purchased a firearm with the intent of turning around and selling it for a profit. And let me also say I've probably watched all the videos on YouTube and some of them more than once about what to do and not to do if law enforcement, including the ATF or FBI or any other government agency comes to your house. In this video, I'm going to give a shortened version of what happened because the first two videos that I made in the series right after this happened last year in October, the two videos total were about 22 minutes long. And so for those who haven't heard the story, I want to make a video that shortens it down and make it easier to watch. And for those who have been following me since then, if you're looking for an update, that will be at the end of the video. So let's go all the way back to October of 2019. I purchased a used Beretta PX4 Storm in 40 cal and over a period of four months I probably put 150 200 rounds to it and it's a very nice gun but it's one of those guns you either love it or hate it and I really didn't hate it but it just didn't feel right to me in the hand and then in January or February of 2021 just before vid hit I took that pistol to a local gun show with the intent of trading it or selling it to one of the tables there at the show and then using it in trade or if I got it money for it to purchase a new firearm. Since it was before the bid hit, prices for firearms and ammunition were nowhere near what they were when the bid did hit. And all the tables I took the firearm to, they were lowballing me in price. So I got a drink and went outside and sat down. And like most gun shows in Florida, there are people outside and inside who are trying to sell firearms. Very rarely have I sold a firearm via private transaction. For as long as I've been collecting firearms, you can count on one hand the times that I've done so. There were quite a few guys out there trying to sell firearms and a lot of people interested in looking at those firearms too as well. And I had three different people come up to me interested in purchasing my pistol. The first guy looked at it, we agreed on a price, but he didn't have a Florida driver's license. He had an out-of-state driver's license, so I could not sell that firearm to him. Another person looked at it, we agreed on a price, and he tells me he doesn't have any ID at all. So of course I couldn't sell the firearm to him. The third person looked at the firearm, we agreed on the price, he showed me his Florida driver's license, I checked that he was 21 years age of older, I believe he was 23 or 24, I asked him if he was a convicted felon and he said no, and he didn't give off any bad vibes, he seems like he was being truthful, so I sold the firearm to him. Now let me also say in Florida, you can sell a firearm through a private transaction and it doesn't have to go through an FFL and you just have to go through the few steps that I mentioned and you don't have to write any information down either. Now after people watched my first video on this last year, a lot of people asked me, if you had to do it again, would you write down the information? And yes, I would have. But I was just going by Florida law at that time and that's still the law now. After I sold it, I went back into the show and used that money to purchase another firearm. I have mentioned this in a couple of my videos. I had been a longtime caregiver of my mother for over five years, and I had no help. It was just me, myself, and I. And in 2021, her health started getting worse and worse. Numerous times taken to the hospital, going to a lot of doctors, and she passed away on August 21st, 2020. And of course, I was very devastated. Besides all the emotions you have, you can't eat, you can't sleep. And since it was during bid, it took a long time for a medical examiner to examine the remains and issue a death certificate and then her be cremated and then get her remains back. Most of the time they tell me it's seven to 10 days, maybe two weeks, and it took almost a month and a half. Also, of course, you have to contact friends and family members, trying to work out funeral details and also take care of all of her affairs as well. And then fast forward a little bit to October of 2020 on the Friday before Columbus Day. I was out running some errands in the evening and I came home between 5.15 or 5.30. And when I came to the door, this card was on the door. And this is from the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and Explosives from a lady special agent from the ATF. And on the back of it, it says, Troy, please call me at a certain number. 
And of course then you say to yourself, why are they trying to get a hold of me? I have no record, I haven't done anything wrong, and, and I racked my brain over and over why they wanted to talk to me, and I couldn't come up with anything. I called the number, and there was no answer, and, and I left a message. I didn't receive a call that evening, I didn't receive a call on Saturday, I didn't receive a call on Sunday, I didn't receive a call on Monday, and I finally received a call on Tuesday. And on the weekend, I did look for lawyers, but it seems like everybody is specialized nowadays. They're accident attorneys, or medical malpractice attorneys, divorce lawyers. And I was trying to find somebody that had something to do with firearms or the Second Amendment, and I couldn't. So I finally got to talk to the lady ATF agent, and she said that her and her partner needed to meet with me. And I asked her, may I ask what this is about? And she said it was about a Beretta PX4 Storm pistol. I knew what pistol she was talking about. Was it a 40 caliber? And she said yes. Asked her, well, what can I help you with? She said a felon was arrested and had that firearm in his possession. And when they traced it, it came back to me. Even though that was seven or eight months previous, I knew which firearm it was. And I told her I sold it at a private transaction at the gun show. And she asked for a description of the person and I gave it to her. And she said, well, we still need to meet with you. And even though I shouldn't have because I still hadn't got a hold of a lawyer, I wanted to try to help them as much as I could. But then I should have been very suspicious when she said, can you meet us tomorrow at the local sheriff station? And I said, which is true, I have a transportation problem and I wouldn't be able to. And she said, can we meet you at your address where we came last Friday? And I said, yes. And they said they would be there the next day between three and four. I know all the comments I'm gonna get in this video is gonna be the same ones that I got in the previous video. Law enforcement isn't in your friends. Don't invite them into your house. Get a lawyer. Don't talk to them. And that's why I put the story in about my mom because I was not thinking as, as clearly as I should have. They came to the house. I asked to see their badges and their IDs, which they showed me. I had them sit at the dining room table and I was asked all the normal questions. When did I sell it? Why did I sell it? What was the person's description? And they both agreed once I told them everything that I did everything by the book. So after a while, I thought this was done, and then the big fishing expedition started. A real big one. And that's when the female ATF agent says, how many firearms do you own? And I said, what does that have to do with what we're talking about here? We went to the FFL to pull the 4473. They went through all the 4473s in 2020, and that FFL sells a lot of firearms. So they had to have been there for a long time. And of course, since I'm a firearm collector, they saw a lot of firearms that I purchased over that year. And of course, multiple firearms purchased within a week's time. And when she said that, I said, because I'm a gun collector, I collect firearms. But then what she said next just shocked me. Because of your purchasing habits, we believe you are purchasing firearms and selling them to make a profit without a license. I said, what proof do you have of this? I said, you have proof that I purchased those firearms. Do you have any proof that I purchased firearms to sell them for a profit. She wouldn't answer that directly. She, her answer was, your purchasing habits leads us to believe that's what you're doing. They had nobody that said that's what I'm doing because that's not true at all. No proof whatsoever. And then they take out some type of a list. And from what I can remember, they called out three or four firearms. There was a Tech 9, a Jimenez or Lorsen 25 Auto, and then something else. I, I can't remember what it was. Now my collection of firearms runs a wide gambit. It goes from cheap German revolvers from back in the 60s to cheap semi-autos all the way up to firearms that are thousands and thousands of dollars. And like I said in the first part of the video, I have never purchased a firearm with the intent of turning around and selling it for a profit. Like anybody that collects anything, whether you collect firearms, coins, stamps, sports cards, cars, anything like that, for, if for whatever reason a certain firearm, coin, stamp, sports card falls out of favor, or you have more than one of those, a lot of people will either sell them or trade them and then turn around and purchase something else for their collection. It's done all the time. So even though I argued that fact, they were dead set that I was selling firearms for a profit without a license, even though they had no proof. And after I mentioned a couple of firearms, and two of them were small little what people call mouse guns, the collection that I have of those firearms, two plastic boxes that are kind of like what people call Tupperware. They were originally made to hold photographs, but the little handheld guns fit perfectly in them. And of course, once I say this, I'm gonna get the same comments I got in the first video. You should have never showed them your guns. You should have never did this. They never asked. I was dead set on proving them wrong. 
So I told them I was going to go get the, the case of the firearms, that none of them were loaded, so I didn't get a gun pulled on me. And I brought them out, and I said, tell me the serial numbers, and I will prove to you I have those firearms. And of course they didn't want to because I, was, I would have proved to them that they were absolutely wrong in their assertions. And as I mentioned in the first video, they were more interested on the case that I had the firearms in. So that's when she takes out this letter, and I'm going to post that on the screen now, and you can pause it and read it. And it was a cease and desist letter, saying that it appears, not that I am, or they have proof of, that it appears that I'm selling firearms to make a profit without a license. Then she has the gall to ask me to sign it, and I told her I wasn't going to sign it, because what they were saying was not true. And as you can see, she said refused to sign. And as they were getting ready to wrap things up, I asked them, do I get a copy of that? And they said, no, but you can take a picture of it. Later in that week, I finally got a hold of somebody via email, a lawyer that deals with cases like this. And I sent him a picture of the letter, and I sent him a very long email of what happened. His response was, they do this a lot. He goes, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can appeal it. Oh, also I forgot to tell you, as they were leaving, the male ATF agent turns around and says, oh, by the way, don't sell any more firearms through a private transaction. If you're going to sell or trade any firearms, it has to be through an FFL. It doesn't say that in the letter, as you can read. He just threw that out as they were leaving. Pretty amazing, huh? But the story even gets a little bit better, or worse, however you look at it. The next Monday, I was going to get my trash cans in the evening after the trash men emptied them. And when I went outside, my next door neighbor was doing the same thing. And whenever we see each other, we usually talk a little bit. And he comes over, he said, did the ATF ever get a hold of you? And I know my jaw dropped when he said that. I said, well, how do you know about that? He was going back to the Friday when they first came to my house when I was not at home. So what happened after they knocked on the door or rang the doorbell or whatever, they decided to go over to his house and they asked him if he had a phone number for me. And he said no. And of course, they showed them their badges. And then they said, thank you, and they started to leave. And of course, like some nosy neighbors are, he, he said, well, what is this all about? Instead of them saying, we can't tell you, the guy ATF agent turns around and says, well, we're the ATF. It's about guns, of course. But ah, uh, it gets even better or worse, like I said, how you look at it. Next week, I was outside doing some yard work on the other side of the house, closer to where my ne other next door neighbor is. And he comes up to me and he says, a couple of Fridays ago, I almost called the police. I said, what happened? And I thought he was talking about something on his property. He said, I was outside doing yard work, and he said, two vehicles pulled up and parked in, in near your front of your house, and a man and woman got out and went up to your front door and were banging very loudly on it and ringing the doorbell. And they said they did that for about five minutes. But here's what really gets me, is then instead of turning around and leaving, they walked around the side of the house. And evidently, they went into the backyard right near the back of my house where he couldn't see them anymore. And he said that they were there for about five minutes. And instead of going back the same way, they came and circled around the whole house. And that's when they went to my other next door neighbor and talked to him. Now, as far as an update, there's really not that much to say. I've still been purchasing firearms. Of course, not as many because the prices are just so high. I haven't sold or traded any, not because they said I couldn't. They did say I could through an FFL, but there's not much that I really want right now. And if I was in for the money, and I'm only allowed to sell them to an FFL, with the prices so high, I could have got a good amount of money for some of the firearms that I have. And then yet, I have not done so because I don't need the money. I, that's not what I do. I am a firearm collector. I could have made a ton of freaking money. So in closing, let's wrap this up. A couple of people made comments in the first video I made last year, and they were right when they said the video should have been renamed what not to do when the ATF comes to your house. And they're absolutely right. But that's why I said there was extenuating circumstances because of my mom passing away less than two months before they came to my house. So if you watch this video and somebody does come to your house, just do the exact opposite of what I did. It's amazing when you put out a video like that because a lot of people watched it. The first video that I made last year got over a half a million views. The second one, I believe it was 250,000 views. And of course you get all these idiots leaving comments. I had a couple of people say, I'm one of the people that gives the Second Amendment a bad name. 
And that's amazing because ever since I made that video, I try to make a video every single day of the week about what's going on in this country with the Second Amendment and putting out information that is very important and getting people to sign petitions and how we can fight against people trying to destroy our Second Amendment rights. And I want to thank you guys for all your support since I restarted my channel last October after this happened. Most of you have been very kind and I have a loyal following and I appreciate your support very much. And as always, leave your thoughts in the comments section down below. And if you enjoyed the video or if I gave you some information you didn't know, please like, share, and subscribe and hit those post notifications. And I'll see you guys in the next video.